post uh, questions throughout uh, while we are, uh, we have a, a presentation uh, by Ryan, uh, put, put it on the chat. If you don't know how to use chat, it's on the bottom. There's a, a, one of the options available, uh, chat. So if you can uh, put it in there and I will, um, will either read or uh, will get it answered uh, later on. Brian? But Lana, thank you so much for the warm welcome. That is a high bar that you set for me to speak to. So I'm going to do my best to meet and uh, have a wonderful speech for everyone here this morning. Thanks again for the opportunity to speak here, and it's a real honor. It's a pleasure to meet everyone here, and I'm hoping that I can come back just to visit as a regular participant at some point because I love what this club is doing. Svetlana, I'd like to share my screen, uh, and I see that when I click Host Disabled Participant Screen Sharing, what can I do to pull these slides up? Svetlana, thanks. It looks it. like we're able to take care of that now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Svetlana, can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Wonderful. Today's talk is called From Mercury to the International Space Station, A History of Food Safety at NASA. I'm the ISS Food System Manager, and I work in SF4 at Johnson Space Center. That's the Human Systems Engineering and Integration Division. A little bit about me. I was born in Auburn, Alabama. That's a small college town, not too different from College Station. I got a bachelor's in the arts in English from UNC Chapel Hill in 2010, which is a far cry from what I'm doing today. After I graduated, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do with a degree in English. So I started working in the food industry. I started working in restaurants, and banquets, and I got really interested in food, not only in people eating it, but also people throwing it away. I realized we throw away a huge amount of food in the United States, and so I started wanting to go back to school to study different ways that we could reduce food waste. I ended up going back to school in food science at North Carolina State University. Uh, NC State has more engineering programs than Chapel Hill does, so I did a post-baccalaureate in food science there, and I ended up studying different sustainable technologies that can improve food systems around the world. While I was there, I got the opportunity to come to NASA. I was a Space Food Systems Laboratory intern in 2014, and then once again in 2016. So after I finished at NC State, I went to UC Davis, uh, in California, and I studied food science there. I received my PhD in 2018 and was invited to come back to Johnson because of the multiple internships I had had. And I came down here and was invited to be the ISS food system manager. Been in that position since October 1st, 2018. So at the end of this month, I'll have been here two years. So very fresh for a lot of Johnson Space Center employees, but two years is a long time for me in my career now. Next, I wanna talk about hazard analysis and critical control points. Raise your hand if you've heard about HACCP or hazard analysis and critical control points. Okay, I don't see any hands up. This is good. This is new information for folks. 
HACCP or hazard analysis and critical control points is the most important idea in food safety in the United States. It's the idea that you can break a process down into all of its different subsystems, analyze the risk of each of those subsystems, monitor the controls that you have in place, and then you use that to feed it back into the system and improve the safety of the system overall. It's the gold standard for how food safety is standardized in the United States. And this was a joint effort between NASA originally and the Pillsbury Company. At NASA, it was Dr. Paul Lachance, and at Pillsbury, it was Howard Bauman. And U.S. Army Laboratories, Mary Clico, was also involved. Natick is the location of U.S. Army Food Research, and they've also been involved in space food research with us since the beginning. So the critical control point concept, of course, came from the engineering world, originally from munitions manufacture from uh, World War I and World War II. So originally, HACCP was implemented at Pillsbury in response to a food safety issue. So this started in, in industry, and NASA asked Pillsbury to come up with a system that they were able to translate to the rest of the food industry in the United States. And so working together, NASA, Pillsbury, and eventually this went to the FDA, where they standardized it for the whole country, came up with a system that they called food safety through the hazard analysis and critical control point system. And this was in 1969. And now it's not only spread throughout the United States, it's throughout the entire world. So it was first applied in the canning industry, um, specifically because canned foods historically have had the most foodborne illnesses. This is because canned foods, if they're not canned properly, they can make people very sick with botulinal toxin. Botulinal toxin is produced by Clostridium botulinum. That's a microbe that grows when all of its competitor bacteria have died. And when Clostridium botulinum grows, it produces this toxin, which is the most potent biological toxin known. So if you've heard of botulism poisoning, this is what people get when they eat foods that haven't been properly canned. So this was first applied in the canning industry, and then it was widely used in national and state regulations throughout the United States. So HACCP started with NASA working with industry and it spread throughout the United States, and it forms the basis for what we still do at NASA today. Next, let's take a look at different food systems from Mercury to Apollo. A lot of folks still think that our, that our Mercury and Gemini food system is tubes and cubes. We call this the tubes and cubes food system. And a lot of folks still think that our food looks very space age, that it looks like this, that we still send up freeze dried ice cream, that sort of thing. Honestly, we don't. What we send up for the International Space Station, we try to make it look as much like real food as possible. From the Mercury and Gemini food system, NASA's controls were very, very strict. They wanted absolutely no food floating out of the package. So they didn't, they also didn't know if humans at a very basic level could eat in microgravity. So what NASA designed was the tubes and cubes food system. The tubes are, are just what they sound like. They're toothpaste tubes filled with pureed vegetables and then canned so that they're shelf stable. And then the cubes are different foods that have been pressed into a tiny cube so that the crew member was able to open the package and eat it without generating any crumbs. Each of these cubes was coated in gelatin. There are a lot of different flavors of cubes that were produced, and I'll show you a picture of the machine that was used to produce them in a couple of slides. So after Mercury came Gemini and the Gemini foods, the later Gemini foods, what NASA did was take the input from the crew members, which was essentially, this isn't food at all because food is not only getting nutrients in, it's also how you eat. It's the sensory experience, the psychological experience, 
and it needs to remind you of being on Earth because of the stresses of space. So what NASA did in the later Gemini food system was develop a rehydration gun so that it could shoot into these rehydratable food packages and then the crew member could cut it open and eat it with a spoon. So this was a very important concept because what it did was allow the crew members to use utensils and it much more closely simulated the experience that crew members had while they were eating on earth so that eating in space reminded them of being home. And this has been the strategy that's been used by the food lab since the beginning is instead of trying to produce a new sensory experience, something gastronomical, let's say, what's important is to make sure that the customers are getting what they want and that the customers are reminded of foods that they love, foods that they've eaten with their families. In this case, our customers are ISS crew members. And so what we provide is a food system that is normal food that they are familiar with, that they're going to eat, that they're gonna eat day after day for six months to a year. And this helps crew members to eat foods that remind them of home, get the nutrition that they need and have a good time while they're eating the food. Next, let's take a look at the Apollo food system here. For Apollo, what was designed was several new types of hardware, including something called a spoon bowl. The spoon bowl was interesting because it had a large opening at the top. So the crew members could rehydrate it with a water gun that had been developed, but the large opening at the top had a zipper closure. So it could be opened and eaten with a spoon by the crew members. So this food had resealable packaging. It had a large opening. It was much more similar to how crew members eat on earth than any of the previous food systems. So some of the early space food design parameters that drove these cubes and tubes, the picture here we have is the cinnamon toasted bread cubes. So on these early missions, there was no availability of water. They didn't have any devices that could inject water into a freeze dried food. So all of the water had to be contained in the food itself. There were very limited storage facilities. There was no cold or frozen storage. There was low volume available for foods and the foods had to be very low residue. Uh, in other words, it's something that you don't want to feed to the astronauts that makes them have a bowel movement. For nutrition requirements, it also had to essentially have all of the nutrition that the crew members needed in just a few different items. Because of the limited amount of volume, this drove the food system to have only a few different types of foods. And so what that meant was these foods had to be uh, very dense nutritionally with all of the vitamins and minerals that the crew members needed. In terms of acceptability, the crew members tasted and tested all of the foods on the ground before they went into space. But what they found was, even though the crew members said, oh, this is okay, this is fine, once they got into space, they realized that the crew members were not a big fan of these tubes and cubes. Cabin pressure was also uncertain in the early Mercury and Gemini missions. And for that reason, all of this packaging was created. It was vacuum sealed so that if there was any sort of low vacuum pressure in the cabin, then the food wouldn't explode or be able to escape. There were also flammability concerns in the early missions, and so the food had to be stowed in a way that the plastic uh, that was used to package the food couldn't line on fire. And then finally, spacecraft specifications. The early ones just didn't have any ability to produce water. Uh, so everything had to be contained in the food itself. And then, of course, we don't have bathroom facilities on Mercury and Gemini missions. So, again, we're looking for things that, that don't cause people to, uh, to urinate or to have a bowel movement. Next, let's take a look at cube forming. This was the giant green machine that was used to press the cubes of food. This was a machine that NASA had. 
and um, Whirlpool was the company that was contracted to do this work. So a lot of folks think that NASA have, has produced all of the food um, since, since Mercury and Gemini. And the truth is NASA has contracted out all of this food. The, the NASA develops the requirements, but then the food production itself has been contracted out to different groups throughout history. Next, let's take a look at our microbiological standards. So in 1971, um, we had very, very strict microbiological standards in terms of total aerobic plate count. That's the total amount of bacteria that'll grow in a normal oxygen atmosphere. Very low coliform counts, streptococci and salmonella. There were very, very strict microbiological controls in the original food design parameters. Our current microbiological requirements for the ISS are designed to not be so stringent on limiting the total amount of bacteria that can go to the ISS, but instead target specific pathogens that would be of concern to the crew, specifically uh, Enterobacteriaceae, that includes E. coli, Salmonella, and then yeast and mold we try to limit. Next, let's take a look at the food systems that came after Apollo. So my favorite food system is Skylab. Skylab's food system was very influenced by the design of that decade. A lot of open space and chrome and orange and triangles. And I loved how Skylab's food system looked. It's very space age. I think it fits our idea of what the space age looks like. The Skylab food system, because Skylab was built from the hollowed out insides of old Apollo mission hardware, Skylab had a lot of volume that could be used and also refrigerators and freezers. So the Skylab food system was actually NASA's most advanced food system that was ever built. Skylab's food system had individual heating and cooling trays for each of the crew members, and they had a huge selection of different foods that they could choose from. The Skylab food system also had a very interesting beverage container that was shaped like an accordion. So it was very low volume, and all of these accordion beverages were collapsed and then sent in a long aluminum canister to Skylab. It was very space age. So the crew members would pull out one drink at a time and then rehydrate it with water and the accordion beverage would swell up and then you would have this long accordion beverage that you were drinking from. So it was very space age. After Skylab came the shuttle food system and this was our early shuttle food system. If this looks like the tray of food that you eat while you're on an airline, you're exactly right. This is very much developed so that crew members can eat it while they're sitting down, while they're in transit, and while they're busy doing their work or shuttle. Here we had a food system that was designed to be as fast as possible. So the crew members had these trays that were attached to their knees. They had Velcro going around the back of this tray that could be attached to their knees. So unlike Skylab, which had a devoted galley area with a table where the three different crew members would eat standing around the table, for shuttle, the, this became a very modular food system. So at that point, the crew members were able to really pull the food out of the lockers that had their individual names on them and pull out all the food that was meant for them. So one other thing I wanna mention here is that throughout uh, the history of space food from Mercury, Gemini, all the way through shuttle, um, all of these foods had a huge amount of crew preference involved in developing the specific food. So crew members were chosen for their missions and gave their preferences to the food lab months and sometimes years in advance so that the food lab could launch these specific foods for the crew members and make sure the crew members were getting what they wanted while they're in space. 
for the shuttle food system, this was the case as well. And this was the best case of NASA being able to supply all the food on the same vehicle that the crew members were launched on. So for a shuttle, the crew members were able to eat the food that they had requested for their two week period, let's say that their mission lasts. For shuttle, the salt and pepper dispensers came in liquid form. We had beverage pouches that could be used with a rehydration station. Excuse me, I'm gonna go back one slide. The rehydration station was able to rehydrate the beverages and the freeze dried foods as well. And then NASA started doing its own thermostabilized foods in pouches. So instead of canning in round cans like we had done in the past, we went to a very low residual volume thermostabilized pouch. This is just like the Sunkist, excuse me, the Starkist tuna pouches that you see at the grocery store. So once everything was eaten out of the pouch, the crew member could just roll it up and then add it into the trash. So finally, we get to the International Space Station. A little background. Everyone here knows in 2011, the shuttle program ended. And so US crew members were being launched on Soyuz vehicles from Russia. This was the first time that food had to be launched on separate vehicles months in advance of when the crew members themselves were actually getting there. So this created a huge logistics issue for the International Space Station food system. You couldn't uh, just pack and ship up the same food that the crew members wanted on the same vehicle and make sure that it's there at the exact same time. So you're launching food originally on progress vehicles months in advance. And what happened was the ISS program found that because of the logistics nightmares and because of the late crew swaps in terms of Soyuz vehicles, that crew members were shifting around, launch vehicles were shifting around, and astronaut Doug wasn't getting what astronaut Doug requested. Instead, astronaut Doug would get astronaut John's food. And so then neither astronaut Doug nor astronaut John were very happy with this proposition because it turns out that when you're forced to eat another person's food because your food is not there, you end up with some very angry customers. You end up with folks not being happy with having to eat other people's food. And that's not a good situation when you're in a stressful environment. You want the food to be what the customer requested and you want it to be on, there on time for them. One other picture I want to point out here is that the early shuttle food system, the previous photo I showed you was uh, packaging that include foods from the late shuttle system. The early shuttle food system had these food containers that I'm really not a big fan of. You can, for the rehydratable one, it looks like we've got some cheese grits in this rehydratable package. This package was a hard plastic shell and it came in a small rectangle. And it was designed so that the crew member could rehydrate it through this little port in the corner. And then the crew member would peel the plastic off the top but it turns out that these are actually not all stackable together. It was, it was designed to be stacked by the crew members to minimize the waste, but it turned out that once the crew members started throwing these into the trash, they're not gonna dig back into the previous meals, pull out all of these packages and then rotate them, stack them together and then put them back in there. So this great idea actually turned out to be really an awful idea in terms of space saving <laughs> because the crew members didn't do it. Uh, it ended up taking a whole lot of space. It was a lot of plastic use. And so ultimately we ended up going with the current freeze dried food pouch, which I think we should have done from the beginning. It's just very simple. And ultimately where all of our, our food packaging has gone is minimize the volume minimize the mass. That's what we want to do for our ISS food system. So after the, the nightmares with the plastic containers not being able to stack, let's zoom in on the shuttle food. So 
this is our mac and cheese. Our macaroni and cheese is one of the crew member favorites. This went into what we call the EDO pouch. The EDO pouch was a plastic pouch that we were able to freeze dry our food in these small rectangles. So we would put it into the freeze dryer in these small rectangles so it came out in the shape that it would be packaged in. And then we put it into the small EDO pouch and put a heat seal on every side. So this packaging was much better than the early shuttle packaging that couldn't be stacked because it's not a hard plastic. Once the crew member cuts this open with scissors, they're able to eat everything out of that package and then they can roll it up and throw it away. The other thing I wanna point out about the shuttle food system is that during shuttle, NASA developed its best utensil kit to date. It was a magnetic, utensils. These utensils were able to stick to the shuttle food trays. So being magnetic was very important for these utensils. NASA ended up buying a, a massive lot of silverware to get us through shuttle. And then when shuttle program ended, we ended up having a lot of extra shuttle silverware. So on the International Space Station today, we're still using the shuttle silverware because it was such a successful utensil kit. So each crew member still gets a utensil kit that's labeled with shuttle. The crew members keep asking us, why are you still engraving shuttle on our International Space Station utensil kits? Well, it turns out they're just still engraved from back when they were originally purchased. Next, let's take a look at early International Space Station foods. So the early ISS food system had around 130 different options, and they were designed for six-month missions. There was a 10-day repeating menu, and the USOS and Russian crew members shared food by design. It was designed to be a truly international cooperative effort so that the US crew members were able to get Russian food and the Russian crew members were able to get US food. But it turned out that resupply delays meant that preference menus did not coincide with crew members on orbit. So just like we were talking about previously, astronaut Doug got astronaut John's food and then astronaut John got astronaut Doug's food. And neither astronaut Doug, Doug nor astronaut John were very happy with that at all. You can see in the early ISS food system. This is our EDO pouch that we were talking about previously. So the EDO pouch that was used during shuttle was transitioned to station. This was a very low volume, low mass pouch that was great for putting freeze dried foods inside and then rehydrating them. The one difference that we had for the International Space Station was we had to redo all of our packaging labels so it said rehydrate with so many milliliters of water instead of so many fluid ounces because the shuttle water dispenser was all in fluid ounces but of course the ISS dispenser was in milliliters. Here we have a crew member warming up a thermostabilized food pouch in the suitcase food warmer. The suitcase food warmer held the foods inside, you would close the lid, and then it would heat everything up through conduction. For the engineers here, this is a very important point about heating foods in space. So ovens on Earth heat foods through convection. They heat up the air and then the air heats up the food. But in space, that convection doesn't work as well. So all of the foods are heated by conduction. That means the food has to be in direct contact with heating plates. So it has to be held down by some sort of clamp and then the food is heated up by direct contact with the plates. The picture below here, we've got ISS crew members eating off of their, their galley food table, <laughs> and everyone's digging in on all the different foods that are available. This is Russian food here. Looks like we've got some Huggies wet wipes that people are using to help clean up their hands, and then all the different cans are these green ones, these are, this is a very interesting photo because these green cans were foods that were designed by ESA and ESA's 
food. This was the first food set of food that ISA sent to us. These were all canned German foods. And so the crew members were able to share the Russian food, the canned food from ISA, and then of course all the American foods in NASA's food system. Here in the corner, you can see that we have a large bottle of sriracha. Sriracha may be one of the favorite hot sauces on station. Crew members tend to consume a lot of that, and so we've got to regularly resupply the sriracha. Next, let's take a look at flight food containers. So after shuttle program ended, the immediate resupply plan was launch everything on the Progress vehicles. On Progress, the cargo was stowed in these collapsible food containers. Um, these metal containers were essentially steel boxes that were collapsible once they were on orbit, once you pulled the pins out of the corner. Um, the food inside was very well protected because it was launched in these collapsible food containers. However, once the US developed its own cargo resupply vehicles and food was no longer being launched on the progress, the food lab was tasked with developing some kind of food stowage configuration that didn't require these, these collapsible food containers. The other point that went into making this decision was that Russia wanted to charge uh, a high cost to the ISS program for using the, for selling the collapsible food containers to NASA. And NASA said, let's just develop our own. So the food lab was tasked with developing their own stowage material. And the food lab ended up going with something called a bob or a bulk overwrap bag. And the food here you can see is actually in a see-through container and we've got it wrapped in pink polyester overwrap. The pink poly is just there to uh, keep the hardware clean before it's launched on a resupply vehicle. But this food we call a, a food bob, a bulk overwrap bag, and it's clear plastic and it helps to keep the food tight and stowed together, but it's very lightweight. And then once the crew members are done with it, the plastic can be disposed of. Next, let's take a look at the ISS food system since 2008. So after all those different resupply issues happened in 2008, when astronaut Doug got astronaut John's food and vice versa, the crew office and the ISS program asked the food lab to come up with a standard menu. And the standard menu was meant to be a menu that contained a high number of items so that the crew members and get tired of the food, but also something to eat from pantry style. So since 2008, we've had over 200 options in these eight standard menu categories. So each one of these food containers or bobs, as we call them, each one of these bobs would be one of these eight categories. So we would have the breakfast bob, the rehydratable meats bob, meat and fish, side dishes, vegetables and soups, fruit and nuts, desserts and snacks and beverages. So there's been limited crew specific food because of the uncertainty in the flight plan and the uncertainty of the resupply vehicles. Right now the astronauts get one, we call it a CSM or a crew specific menu. They get one CSM for every 20 days that they're on station and they get one coffee tea preference container. They each get their own personalized coffee container for every 40 days that they're on station. We've also had limited fresh food. We've been more successful in launching that recently. But fresh food, the, honestly, the hardest thing to send into space is lettuce. Um, in terms of fresh food, you can only put it on vehicles that have essentially a very late load at L minus 24 hours. At that point, the, the only things that you can send, since you're still going to have a few days before you get to the International Space Station, the only types of fresh food that you can send are really sturdy items like apples, oranges, other citrus. Recently, we've started sending onions and garlic. That's a crew member favorite. But ultimately, all of these different fresh foods have to be able to withstand launch and travel to the International Space Station. We also send up a container of condiments. I've said before that sriracha is a fan favorite with the crew members. We also send up barbecue sauce, um, other types of hot sauce, salt and pepper, balsamic vinegar, olive oil, 
things that uh, makes the food more exciting and can provide enough variety for six months to a year. The one thing that's really important about food on the International Space Station is that there's no food refrigeration available. The only thing that the crew members can use as a refrigerator is the Merlin, which was originally designed as a science experiment chiller. So the crew members can use the Merlin as a small chiller for their food items. And often they'll rehydrate their beverages, put their beverages in the Merlin, and then drink them after their workout or the next morning. But there's no food refrigeration available on the ISS. This is very important because it means that all of the food bobs that we're launching to the International Space Station, and with our current flight plan, we're launching about 500 of these to the ISS every year. Uh, to keep the crew fed. What that means is these can't be refrigerated. And one of the obstacles we come up against is that a lot of times people will come up with ideas for new foods, but because refrigeration is so easily available to us here in the United States, we really take it for granted that we've got refrigeration in each of our homes and that we're able to purchase raw ingredients and keep them in the refrigerator until it's time to cook them. We don't have that luxury on the International Space Station. And because no food is refrigerated, what that means is there's no cooking. It means that all the food has to be pre-cooked on Earth and then supplied to the ISS so that the crew members can eat it quickly. And then finally, we've got a shelf life of about one to three years under room temperature storage. So we've got a very long shelf life on these items. When developing new items, we also put them through a very long shelf life study to make sure that it lasts and is still delicious for the crew members to eat after it's been sitting for really up to two and a half years at, at room temperature. And food, because it's biological material, it undergoes a lot of chemical and physical changes in that time. The other thing I wanna mention, people ask a lot, how many do, how long do these food bobs last? It turns out that a set of these eight bobs, one in each menu category, that'll feed a crew of three for seven to nine days, so a little more than a week. So we let the crew members know how long they should have these bobs open, um, depending on how many crew members are on station. More crew members mean they cycle through faster. Fewer crew members means it takes a little bit longer. So Here we've got a couple fun pictures of the astronauts with food that we've launched. We've got an apple and a tomato that we've launched, some crackers, it looks like some Russian food here. And this is the Russian utensil kit in the back, which the crew members also like. And then we've got some tomato paste. We also send up tomato paste, garlic paste, and pesto paste. For here we've got <laughs> here we've got a crew member eating some grits with butter. That's one of our uh, freeze-dried food items that we include in the breakfast container, and the crew members having fun with uh, eating that in microgravity. Next, let's take a look at our facilities. So the food lab is located on site at Johnson Space Center. And the food lab is the central processing point for all of NASA's food that gets sent to the International Space Station. In the food lab, we produce and process all of our freeze-dried foods, as well as receive all of the incoming thermostabilized foods that we produce offsite. So the thermostabilized foods are the ones in the olive green pouches. They kind of look like MREs, but we produce them ourselves at the Space Food Research Facility. That's our facility at Texas A&M that has a retort. It's essentially a large pressure cooker that's able to take pouches of food and then cook them at high temperature and pressure until they're shelf stable. What we do in the food lab is produce and package flight food products, stow them in bulk overwrap bags, and deliver them to the cargo mission contract on Forge River Road, which then sends it out to all of our different launch sites. From there, it's sent to the International Space Station. In the food lab, we maintain a constant inventory of flight food items. That's so that we can support on the ground experiments such as research analogs. We also 
conduct training activities and supply food to the crew members for training. And we also supply food for education and outreach so that the crew members can support outreach activities, take some space food, and have a fun time talking to students about space food. We also conduct research activities supporting the development of food systems for the next generation of deep space exploration vehicles and planetary habitations. That includes lunar base and Mars base design missions. The food that we process at the food lab undergoes a lot of quality control procedures to make sure that the food we're receiving meets our specifications. We then freeze dry the food in our freeze dryer so that it has a very low moisture content. Two of our food scientists here, Donna Neighbors, Connie Ertley, they still work with the food lab today. This food product, they were freeze drying and you can see they have small temperature probes that are put inside the freeze dryer. We have temperature probes in each of the freeze dried food trays. And for anyone who's not familiar with the freeze drying process, it's very simple. It's exactly what it sounds like. Freeze drying, first you freeze the food and then you dry it. And you do that by dropping the temperature of the food to freeze it, and then you pull a vacuum on it. And what pulling the vacuum on it does is once you've got food at low temperature and low pressure, and then you pull off that any remaining atmosphere, what happens is you have sublimation of the ice in the food and it turns directly into water vapor. And that water vapor is captured on condensers in the freeze dryer. So what happens is you end up with a food that is maintained in a frozen state, but is gradually getting drier and drier and drier because of the low pressure. So you end up with a food item that's less than 3% moisture. And this is very interesting because foods start around 90% moisture. After freeze drying for about a week to get that very low moisture content, we end up having less than 3% moisture. And this is what gives us the approximately two and a half year shelf life that we have for foods with the International Space Station. At the Space Food Research Facility, you can see that people do not wear face masks. This is because the microbiological controls don't have to be as strict because all the foods that are processed and put into our thermostabilized food pouches, they go into our retort. The retort cooks all the foods at high temperature and pressure and it kills everything in there. This, this uh, canner essentially helps to make sure that the food is stable at room temperature and pressure and that it lasts for a long time. Next, let's take a look at packaging. This is our packaging room on site at Johnson Space Center. In the food lab, we make sure that we're wearing a a hairnet, a face mask, gloves when we're packaging all of our food items. We also wear booties when we're working in the packaging area so that we can make sure we're not introducing any foreign object debris. Here it looks like we're packaging what we call candy coated chocolates, otherwise known as M&Ms. We package candy coated chocolates and in these, these are specially designed packaging machines for us. First they pull a vacuum on the food they back flush it with nitrogen, pull another vacuum, and then heat seal it. And that makes sure that the foods are vacuum sealed and that all the oxygen possible has been pulled out. This is because light, oxygen, and moisture are the three main enemies of shelf-stable foods. Our controlled storage area has all of our class one food inventory. Class one means that it is food designated for launch the International Space Station and it goes through much stricter quality controls than our class three hardware which has been downgraded and is used for public outreach activities. Our testing area includes storage in room temperature incubators. For our science experiments this is very important because the temperature in the building is not as tightly controlled as our incubators. So our incubators make sure that we're getting good shelf life studies for food products over time. Our testing area also includes devices such as a water activity meter, 
a moisture content analyzer. We have a color analyzer, which can analyze the change in color over time, which also affects crew members' perception and how delicious the food can be to them. And then we also have a texture analyzer. Texture in foods is very important over time. Some foods tend to break down and become too soft. Some foods tend to become harder. Uh, protein bars tend to become harder in time. So that's the problem in the protein bar industry. The flight food inventory that we keep, we take and stow flight food inventory from each of these boxes. Uh, each of these plastic bins holds one type of class one space flight food. Then we sort and stow them into each of these trays. And then each of those trays goes into a bulk overwrap bag that we send to the International Space Station. Finally, fresh food containers include grapes, carrots, apples, tomatoes, delicious items that we can send up that provide a little bit of that crunch, a little bit of that fresh food that's normally not available to the crew since there's no refrigeration available on board. We also have sensory booths in our testing area. The sensory booths are designed so that people can come in, sample the food in a closed off environment so that they're not being biased by other people around them or by the person who's giving the test. And they score all of the foods on a scale of one to nine. It's called the hedonic scale. They score all the foods on a scale of one to nine for the, for the appearance, the odor, the flavor, and the texture. And if the average score of the foods is less than six, we don't send it to the International Space Station. It's not deemed fit for consumption. We have strict quality control procedures including document management, physical analysis of all of our foods, and then finally circling back to the HACCP system, which dictates all of our processes. Our documents include process models that outline how all of our processes in the food lab run, including packaging testing and product receipt. These process models are used to design our space flight food specifications each one of these specifications is more than a recipe. It's a engineering and quality assurance document that confirms that that space flight food is going to be produced to the exact same specification every time. And then finally, we've got our hazard analysis and critical control points written into our task performance sheets. So the task performance sheets where each item is signed off on by an individual. So a food technician signs off on each of these tasks that are performed. These tasks include the critical control points that are necessary to make sure that the food is of class one spaceflight hardware quality. And we also include paper 911 tags, which confirm that our hardware has been in a chain of custody that we trust since the beginning. So the chain of custody here for the butternut squash is traced from the beginning by individuals who are signing off on ownership of the hardware. So we know where it's been at all times. So in terms of key takeaways, for the food system, it's very important to establish a system that promotes safety. We stabilize the nutrition in our foods by giving them a long shelf life, and we make sure that they're acceptable to the crew members for long after they've been produced. With over 200 items in the ISS food system, we've got a large variety of foods that help to make sure the crew member is constantly eating foods that are different than what they ate the day before. Palate fatigue is a huge issue. We also want to reduce resource usage. So that means minimize the amount of heating and cooling and water that's required to maintain your food system. And then finally, what we want to do is promote human health and performance for our astronaut workforce to make sure that they're getting the most out of their time that they're on the International Space Station. That wraps up all of my key points today. Svetlana, thank you so much for having me and letting me talk, and I'd love to field any questions that we have now.
Yeah, I have a question. Um, how many people, one, are in the organization, I guess, to start with, that, that are under you in, in, in this food production process? Sure. Tom, thank you for the question. So the question was, how many people work in the food lab? Tom, we have about uh, 20 people that work in the food lab all together, and they're working in Building 17. Uh, currently, with COVID-19 occurring, we've only got about 10 core people uh, in the food lab. There are about 10 people that are required to produce and process the food, um, and everyone else is able to work off-site. But the answer is we got about 20 warm bodies working for us. Now, NASA, you in early in the talk, you said that you had outside suppliers doing all of the processing. What was the change from a, I guess, a philosophical standpoint that, that NASA made that decision? Or was that well before your time? Yeah, Tom, that's a really good question. It was before my time, but it was during um, the time that the previous ISS food system manager, who was Vicki Claris, uh, my predecessor was here. The, the food still to this day is produced by contractors. Uh, the whole food lab, all 20 people there are on the contractor side. I think uh -huh. the biggest change was after the shuttle program ended, we had a food production facility that was outside the gates. It was still in the Clear Lake area, but it was outside the gates. Um, KBR was, and I, I think it was Wiley at the time, it's gone through a lot of name changes. Um, they were paying rent at that facility, and in order to cut costs, NASA wanted to bring the food production facility on site. So right now we're producing food in Building 17, uh, which was originally designed as an office building. It's taken a lot of retrofitting to give it the ventilation, the uh, clean room area, the refrigeration. You've, you, we're essentially uh, cooking food in an office building, but we're, we have a lot of controls in place to make sure that uh, we're maintaining high quality standards. Do you have people out, out in the field auditing some of your suppliers? Are you able to do that? Tom, yeah, Tom, that's a really good question. Um, because we end up working with, uh, we're a small team, we end up trying to avoid auditing our suppliers by procuring only from large, well-known organizations that we trust. Okay. So what, what that means is, um, like when we're buying, let's say, apples and oranges and cherry tomatoes, we're going to do that from a local well-known grocery store so that they are doing the auditing for us. Like if we go to HEB, for example, HEB has a phenomenal quality assurance program. Um, if we go to HEB, we can know that essentially we're outsourcing the auditing and that okay. HEB is doing the auditing for us. So that's what we try to do because we've got a small team. Um, but ultimately, you're absolutely right. There's got to be auditing processes in place. Um, to make sure that we're getting high quality material. Excellent. All right, I see we've got wanted, some questions. Yeah, I wanted to add to a little bit uh, to Tom's uh, or to uh, Ryan's answer on uh, Tom's question on the big changes. One of the, uh, along with other changes, one of the biggest changes happened and it was a uh, positive for in both uh, in cost savings and uh, in engagement of um, outside resources uh, or specifically students is that expansion into the AM under SpaceX agreement and uh, uh, having that food uh, uh, research facility. Uh, because initially or before, prior to that uh, establishment, uh, it was uh, a long process of uh, putting a few trucks and uh, they would be uh, trucked into a facility where it was uh, uh, designed for uh, creating those MREs or packaging MREs uh, uh, for the uh, military uh, in, uh, establishments. And when mm -hmm. there was a ramp up of the um, um, military effort uh, outside of the United States or there was a need for MRE supply, uh, NASA was put at the bottom of the list for the, uh, as far as the priority. And so that uh, 
that resulted in uh, creating that space uh, under SpaceX uh, Act agreement uh, with uh, AM. But uh, the positive was not just because it saved uh, money, it funding, it also uh, allows students to participate both in space exploration and uh, engage in the, in the food design and food uh, in various research uh, efforts. So it's a, I, I see that as a great positive for win-win situation under Space Act, Act Agreement. I have a couple of questions. Um, one is that you mentioned that uh, heating the food on the space station is done with conduction and not conduction, but uh, has it been considered to use uh, microwave uh, heating? Mike, I'm so glad you asked that. That is a really critical point. Um, it, it would be phenomenal if we could use microwave heating. Uh, and the truth is because we need to have, so there's a, there's a chain of, of consequences here. Because we need to have such a long shelf life on our food products, we have to ensure that our food is packaged in some sort of material that's got a aluminum, small aluminum layer inside the plastic. Because Oops. so our food has to, our food has to be impervious to light and oxygen and moisture. Um, and, and so the best food packaging has a thin layer of aluminum sandwiched in between the plastic. So because we have to use that packaging, that precludes the ability to be able to use a, a microwave on station. Now, the let's if we were able to get around that. So, um, you know, let's say you've got let's say you're you've got a habitation where you know you can pull your food out of the packaging. You're in a gravity environment. Let's say I don't know. Let's say there's a lunar base where you've got gravity. You can put you can put your food, pull it out of the packaging, put it in a microwave. That might be a, a a great way to get that technology in there. Um, I, I know for the ISS there are uh, excuse me electromagnetic wave uh, restrictions in terms of what can be produced on the ISS. So if it were properly shielded, uh, I don't see why it would be an issue. But unfortunately, with the packaging we're using right now, it's just uh, it's not given us the opportunity to use it as much as we'd like to. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. All right. I see we've got a couple questions in the chat here. Uh, and before we keep going, I just want to make sure that that we're given uh, these questions in the chat a response. We have a question from John. Does NASA have a prohibited list of foods or beverages like Pringles or Coke and Pepsi? John, that's a great question. We don't send Pringles because they tend to be very large. So if we do send an item that can crumble or crunch, we want it to be bite-sized. We want the crew member to be able to effectively put the whole thing in their mouth or, or at least be able to handle the crumbs. Pringles have been an issue since the beginning, and that's because they're sent up in a large tube and the crew members can't see what's on the inside. So you open the package up and you've already got crumbles coming out of the package. So the packaging itself is an issue with Pringles. And then once it gets on station, crew members bite into that and you've got crumbs floating away. So crew members know they can eat some of these items uh, next to the vent. We tend to, you know, just make sure crew members are aware of the dangers and the risks. Uh, and we do tend to minimize crumbs for our, our foods and Pringles are definitely a no-go. For the question about Coke and Pepsi, uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. The, there's a very infamous uh, Coke and Pepsi incident in space food history when Coke and Pepsi wanted to send up their foods to space. And so what they did was they packaged their foods. I think this was during shuttle. They packaged their food in a way that it could go into microgravity and then be consumed. And so what ended up happening when the crew ingested these sodas was they got something called the wet burps. And it's just as awful as it sounds. So the wet burp is when you drink a carbonated liquid. And when you're in microgravity, so when you're on Earth, liquid goes to the bottom of your stomach and then gas goes to the top, right? And you, and you just burp up whatever carbon dioxide you've got in there. So imagine in microgravity, your stomach has liquid where the gas is all throughout that liquid. So, so you're having the bubbles coalesce in your stomach, 
and you've got liquid and gas pushing up through your esophagus as an astronaut. So the famous wet burp in, uh, incident gave gave NASA the policy of absolutely no carbonated beverages and microgravity, just not a good idea. John, thanks for that question. We've got a question from Josh. What is the history of sending alcohol to space and what are the NASA and international partner current policies? Josh, that's a great question. And I'll tell you the only thing that I'm allowed to say is that NASA has a strict no alcohol policy. NASA has a strict no alcohol policy, and that's all I can answer to that. Okay, thanks for uh, giving me a few seconds to run through the chat. These folks had submitted questions throughout the talk. Um, do we have any other questions today that I can help to answer? Uh, I have one question. Uh, my granddaughter would love to have a set of these shuttle uh, silverware uh, how how much uh, do you need uh, to get one set? I have my I have my checkbook right here. <laughs> Mike, if you can just mail me your whole checkbook, I think that'll take <laughs> care of it. There's not too many checks left. I got a couple though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, the the shuttle silverware, um, and it brings up a good point. We're actually running out of shuttle silverware. Uh, because we're, we're getting to the end of all that we bought for, for shuttle, uh, and we're in the process of procuring the new silverware. Uh, what we're doing this time is we're being very careful that we're not, uh, that we're not engraving the name of the current space program on the silverware so that we run into the same situation in the future. So we're not, we're not engraving ISS on our silverware so that 10 years down the road, you know, folks are asking, folks on Mars are saying, why are you still engraving our silverware with ISS? So we're just going to put a meatball on it. We're going to go plastic. We're going to put a meatball on it. And we've got uh, silverware that can transfer from, from one program to another. Uh, I, 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 I still think you can, I still think you can sell the, uh, the shuttle silverware in a museum for a pretty good price. Mike, definitely, and we we uh, we coordinate with uh, Johnson. Uh, um, excuse me, the Johnson Museum folks who are able to set up and distribute uh, museum artifacts. We coordinate closely with them to make sure that they've always got what they need. Uh, a lot of the hardware that we do have is is really fun to share with uh, museums around the country. Paul, you had a question. Yes, I wanted to ask about uh, if we plan to go to Mars and growing food is uh, their research research on growing food on uh, on the ISS and is it uh, worth it? Paul, that's a great question. And I think that's central to the research that's going on. Ultimately, when you send a let's say when you send a cookie into space, uh, it doesn't take a lot of time for the crew member to open that package and eat the cookie. When you send flour and eggs and water and sugar into space, you've got a lot more mass that you're dealing with. Uh, you've got a lot more kitchen appliances that you need and you've got a lot more risks that you're running, including how do you control for let's say salmonella in your eggs, um, how do you control for the particulates that are flying around in microgravity? So that's a crucial trade-off um, that NASA has always erred on the side of caution for. Speaking for Mars, there are current experiments on the ISS, like the veggie experiment, where crew members are able to grow and eat food. And Paul, that's a, uh, I know that's a very central question to the research, is how can we design uh, essentially dwarf plants that have a higher proportion of edible materials as opposed to inedible materials. So out of everything that's sent, let's say the hydroponics equipment, whatever farming equipment you have, if that all is 100 kilograms of material that you have to send, how many kilograms of food are you getting out of that? Um, and and that's, that's a very, very important question. Because if you're sending pre-cooked food, 
most of that mass is is food that you can eat and it's it's food that the crew members can eat but but you're absolutely right there could be a place for it in terms of psychological benefit to the crew um, in terms of reminding them of home so if there is up mass available i have no doubt that uh crew will be attempting to grow their own foods Funny. Well, I have uh, one more question, and that is, uh, you mentioned that the uh, enemy of food longevity is uh, oxygen, light, and moisture. Uh, how does temperature play into that? Is, it, is temperature a factor in food longevity at all? Yeah, my great question. Um, there is a temperature range that we shoot for in our in our food products and and you're absolutely right temperature plays a huge role in the shelf stability of our foods honestly i don't include it a lot because we take it for granted because our whole iss food system is essentially temperature controlled around the ambient temperature but you're absolutely right for the foods that we launch into space we do have temperature controls on them that state it should never be frozen and it should never go above 90 degrees Fahrenheit for more than eight hours. This is because if it's frozen, these food items that do have water in them, let's say the, we've got a, a very nice grilled pork chop. So we grill the pork chop, we put it inside of a MRE type thermostabilized pouch, and then we essentially can it. So you've got a whole canned pork chop that's stable at room temperature. Um, if you freeze that product and then thaw it and freeze it and thaw it, you're going to end up getting ice crystals and you end up breaking down the physical structure of the food. So you don't want to freeze these food items. Similarly, if you put it above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, vitamins tend to be very prone to degradation at uh, higher temperatures. So vitamin C is a very unstable vitamin, but it's super important for the health of the crew. So for vitamin C, for example, uh, you wanna make sure that you're keeping your food around ambient temperature. If you do see elevated temperatures, you're gonna see breakdown of these vitamins as the small amounts of oxygen in the package. Um, with, with the higher temperature, you're gonna see increased diffusion of different materials and of course uh, increased chemical reactions and that's not what you want to see in your foods. Thank you. We have one, one more question from Tom. Brian, he was he's asking how does astronaut sense of taste change in space? Tom, that's a great question. How do astronauts sense of taste change? So uh, since we're all since we're all space geeks here, I'm sure we all know when people are launched into space, gravity is no longer pulling all the liquid in their bodies down to their feet. When launched into space, people now have a fluid shift where the fluid in their body is distributed throughout their entire body. And what we see in terms of the sensory perceptions of the crew members is that because of the fluid shift to the head, which is well known and documented. Because of the fluid shift to the head, the nasal passages tend to become clogged. And so the crew members aren't able to smell. Well, it turns out that studies done on the ground have shown that 70% of the flavor of food, so flavor equals aroma plus taste. It turns out that 70% of the flavor of food is from the aroma of the food. So on earth, 70% of what our brain perceives as the flavor of the food is actually coming from the volatile particles from when we chew the food, it goes up into our nasal passages. And that's how we're perceiving the flavor of that food. It's actually mostly from the aroma of the food as opposed to the taste from our tongue. So in space, this is a huge issue. You've already lost 70% of your brain's perception of the flavor of the food because you're not able to get that uh, the, the volatile particles because of gravity causing the volatile materials to rise upwards, you're not getting those volatile materials traveling into your nasal passages. Those are all blocked. You're only getting about 30% of the flavor of the food that you experience on Earth. So the, 
the, the answer is, what do you do about this? And what you do is you provide materials that, that stimulate the tongue. Specifically, you provide hot sauce, you provide horseradish, you provide wasabi. These are all materials that directly stimulate the nerves on the tongue and bypass the nose so that crew members can still have a good flavor perception in terms of the foods that they're eating. Ellen, you have a question, you have a, your hand raised. Yes, you know, I read an article online not too long ago that actually was very surprising and it's uh, tied into what you just said. It said that, you know, you think that a lot of taste comes from your taste buds, but not only does it does taste come from your sense of um, sense of smell from the aroma, but also there's a vision component as well. When you see the food, if it doesn't look like it'll be safe and good for you to eat, it also kind of affects your ability to taste. So I, I found that completely fascinating because I always thought taste just came from taste buds. Ellen, that's absolutely right. And we have a saying, uh, you eat with your eyes before you eat with your mouth. And it's very true. One of the things that we try to do in the food lab is that the new foods that we've added to the standard menu recently are full of color and flavor and texture. We've got a braised red cabbage, which has a beautiful purple color. We've got a phenomenal butternut squash, which has a brilliant orange color. And we've got a kale salad, which actually maintains its green color despite going through the cooking process and being freeze dried. So once it gets to the station, you, you're still able to get a green kale, which is phenomenal. You're absolutely right. You eat with your eyes before you eat with your mouth. And this is something that we're continuing to, to grow in. Uh, like I was talking to Mike, the packaging that we use precludes the ability to see the food as you're, as you're eating it, especially in our thermostabilized pouches. But in our freeze dried food pouches, we do make sure that it has clear packaging so that the crew members can see what's inside. And then of course, we do overwrap that in an opaque packaging so that light can't get through it. So we definitely do eat with our eyes before we eat with our mouth. I have a question for you. Um, you said that one of your interests was dealing with like food waste and how much we waste here in like restaurants on the earth, for example. Is that a concern, something that happens at, on the space station? Nate, definitely. Food waste is always a concern. And we have food waste on the International Space Station when crew members uh, honestly get super sick and tired of eating the same 200 items for six months. It's kind of like when you go to your fridge at night. And this is, this is definitely true for me during COVID-19. When I open my fridge day after day and I haven't been able to go to the grocery store, it's the same things in there. And so we get menu fatigue. Menu fatigue is when you're eating the same thing day after day. So when crew members are eating a food like say what's one of our what's one of our least favorite items? How about the grits with butter? Um, <laughs> the grits with butter weren't a fan favorite. When you're when that's when that's something that you're seeing every day and you're not even a big fan of it on Earth, the astronauts are just not going to eat it. So what that means is when the astronauts don't eat it, they not only don't get the nutrition that that food provides because it's not acceptable to them, it also means that the fuel, the energy, the time that we spent to launch that food is not being fully utilized. So Nate, you're, you're totally right. I think food waste is an issue on the ISS and the biggest way that we're tackling it is actually using all the information that we have we communicate with the crew, with the nutrition lab. It's taking off all those foods that people are not eating and adding in the new foods that we've developed that we know people like. So it's constantly revising our menu to make sure that it's chock full of items that people will eat and that they're not going to get tired of. So we're constantly working to improve the standard menu as a whole to minimize food waste.
Wow, thank you so much. This was a great presentation, great talk on food uh, on ISS. And uh, just a little bit, as you brought up uh, the one of the visuals on M&Ms, Dave uh, pulled out uh, M&Ms, and so we've been eating in here too, <laughs> just because you reminded. I don't think it's. Uh, I don't know if you can see now. That it's a <laughs> jar, just totally translucent. Anyway, yes, M&Ms. That, that's uh, food uh, for for our uh, re-energizing. Re Again, thank you very much, and thank you every, everyone for joining us. We'll, uh, um, Ryan, really pleasure. Join us next week. Uh, we will. Um, I think next week is the environmental focus, uh, and um, but I will send a reminder to everyone. Uh, again, as a reminder, we have uh, switched the link, so this link should be working from now on. I know we had some. Uh, issues with uh, joining uh, for some of our um, members but uh, uh, keep it stored wherever you want to every Saturday 8 30 um, like a clock we'll uh, we'll meet you and uh, we'll continue our space space gig speak I'm really happy to see each and every one of you from uh, Houston all the way to France thank you <laughs> Paul or where are you now are you still in France uh, I am in uh, Cranfield in the UK, uh, UK. Uh, since one week. Yeah. Okay. All right. Glad you're there. 14 days. Okay, so quarantining on 14 days and then going with the classes. Well, um, we, we wish you a, a great year and um, healthy and safe. And while we got some folks here who like to participate in Zoom meetings, whereas this is once a week, I have the once a week HEAA. Once a month. Once a month, that's <laughs> what I meant to say. As opposed to once a week, once a month, the HEAA, Houston Electric Auto Association meeting, which comes up this following week, the first Thursday of October happens to be the first. We have two speakers, one from Lone Star Specialty Vehicles, who will talk about electric vehicles like trucks, and the other is a representative of the candy company, and they are going to be providing the lowest cost electric vehicles to the US market. And uh, so you can look at heaa.org to register and get the link if you're interested. We'd love to see you. We usually have a good group there. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to have in-person meetings since uh, March, April. Um, and so we are doing the Zoom meetings uh, and uh, it's working out really well. So I hope to see some of you there. Right, and uh, one more announcement, uh, AAA Houston section will be holding annual technical symposium. We had to scramble and uh, cancel our normal in the spring. And so this, uh, we, are, we moved it kind of off uh, normal to the, to the full. And uh, information on how to submit uh, uh, abstracts. Uh, John is, uh, John Deloria is uh, one of the uh, co-chairs for that um, uh, event information for abstract submission and the uh, links and uh, registration and so on it's free event will be on awahouston.org and uh, if you can't find send me a, send me email or um, reach out to me via uh, LinkedIn or any other way that you have uh, options to <laughs> reach out to me and I'll provide you a link provide you information and with that, thank you very much. Thank uh, you, Ryan. Thank uh, you, everyone. I'll, I'll throw in one other thing. In November, we expect to have a speaker about electric airplanes. So just to try to keep more in the uh, aerospace aeronautics theme, <laughs> but uh, this uh, uh, coming October 1st will be the two speakers I mentioned, and we'll have one or two speakers on the first Thursday in November, one being by aerospace. Okay. Okay, any other comments? Speaking about, electrical, speaking about electrical aircraft, uh, uh -huh. this week in Cranfield, so in the airport just behind uh, next to my residence, the first commercial uh, hydrogen airplane fl uh, uh, fly. All this right. Yeah. yeah, I read or I heard something on the on the news uh, yeah. about it. Yeah, just, that's cool. Uh, at the airport of my university. Wow. 
Okay. That's, that's great. Well, if you if you hear something, maybe you can come and um, talk about that. Yeah. So in it, future. What? So I can look it up. What's the exact name of the university? Cornfield University. Cornfield, Cornfield University. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks. Everyone, have a good weekend, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye.